Hello, everybody, and welcome to our studio show here at Pietro Murata in Italy. The first three rounds have all been flyaways, of course, but here we are, the first of our European leg, and it's on this uh, hard-packed circuit in the shadow of the Dolomites. We've got uh, another lot of interesting guests here this weekend, starting with Glenn Koldenhoff from MXGP. Alexander Tonkov will be with us. So, too, will Davey Coombs from RacerX Magazine. And, as always, I'll be joined by Adam Wheeler from OnTrackOffRoad.com. But before we go any further, Argentina was three weekends ago, so let's see what happened in the MXGP race, race two. Here's some of the highlights from that weekend. After his victory in race one, Clement de Salle arrived at the gate in confident mood. But any one of the first four riders from that first race, de Salle, Cairoli, Nagel or Villapoto were realistically in with a chance of winning. As Jeremy van Horbeek took his place on the grid after his crash with a slight thumb injury, he knew a good start would be important in this second race. Max Nagel charged into turn one on the Red Bull Ice One Husqvarna, narrowly edging out de Salle for the foxhole shot. Ryan Villapoto made a slightly better start as Sean Simpson took out Evgeny Bobrashev after losing his back break in a collision with Glenn Koldenhoff on the 259 Rockstar Energy Suzuki. Villapoto once again made light work of the number 89 of Van Horbeek, who was riding slightly injured. But it was this man again, number 12, Max Nagel, from out of nowhere, went from third to second, finding a way past Tony Cairoli and then went in pursuit of number 25, Clement de Salle. And Ryan Villapoto wasn't too far behind either, so the first four guys were right where we wanted them to be. De Salle made a few mistakes in the second half of the race, and that allowed Max Nagel to gain ground. Eventually, it was the German who stormed into the lead before the halfway point and started to pull clear. De Salle was struggling in second, Cairoli was third, but the two Yamahas, Van Horbeek getting passed by his teammate, Roman Fevre. Van Horbeek, though, would respond and find his way back into fifth, but Cairoli charged down the inside of De Salle, and in a repeat move that De Salle pulled on the Sicilian in race one, Cairoli was through into second. And the gap between the first four was starting to shrink. Max Nagel, Cairoli, De Salle, Villapoto, all within four seconds of each other in the closing stages of the race, all being urged on by their mechanics down there in pit lane. Ryan Villapoto found his way onto the rear wheel of De Salle, but couldn't quite find a way through. But it was Max Nagel who took the chequered flag in race two and the overall Grand Prix victory, his second of the season. Cairoli was second, De Salle third, Villapoto was fourth, and Horbeek was fifth, but the overall Grand Prix belonged to Nagel. And De Salle leads the championship, Nagel now second on the same points as Tony Cairoli, but for the Red Bull Ice One Husqvarna team, that's two Grand Prix wins out of three in 2015. Well, what a Grand Prix that was just three weeks ago in Argentina. Well, I'm pleased to say that one of the riders that was getting mentioned there, Glenn Koldenhoff, Rockstar Energy Suzuki uh, Europe. Uh, welcome to us here. Last year you were an MX2 rider, now you're an MXGP rookie. Before we start to talk about this season, I uh, just want to cover briefly just one or two moments from last year when you were in the MX2 class in what could have been your best year ever had it not been for one or two injuries starting in uh, Beta Carrero you picked up a race win there your first ever yeah that's true you know um, yeah officially uh, Jeffrey was uh, injured there and that was the first race uh, that we rode uh, without him and actually it went pretty good there uh, first moto I was struggling a little bit and uh, second moto was was way better I uh, got a good start uh, started in second and finally passed uh, uh, Ferrandes for the lead and yeah you know I, I could make a gap directly and yeah I was in uh, in first place uh, I think all moto and um, yeah I finished there so uh, it was a really good weekend for me and in terms of picking up that race when I know you just said Jeffrey was in uh, was out he was absent but from your perspective what did that do to your confidence because you took a Grand Prix victory the year before at Matley Basin without taking a race win but suddenly the win came here in Brazil yeah you know it's uh, it's always hard to finally make a win and um, 
yeah, here was the fight also for the red plate, so it was uh, definitely more uh, nervous than other races, you know. And um, but I was really happy to make it, and uh, yeah, it was just a just a great weekend. Because I think that was a fantastic start to the season overall, wasn't it, Glenn? I mean, you had uh, three podiums in five rounds, I think, including yeah. a, a victory here and a, and a podium here in Italy. So, you know, it's such a shame that knee injury then just before your home Grand Prix, because it would have been, I don't know, you were the probably the most likely contender for Jeffrey Herlings' title that year. Yeah, yeah, I think also together with Donus. Donus was also really strong last year and... Um, no, we definitely had a good fight uh, every, every every race, and uh, as you said, I got three podiums, so um, I was definitely uh, on the way to make a good year, that's for sure. And obviously, Adam just mentioned one of those coming here, because again, you had another race win here. What was the difference between winning in Brazil, because there was a big crowd there, but a non-European crowd, obviously, and then winning in Italy, where I'm sure there were you know, a lot of Dutch supporters here this week, on that weekend coming here to support you? Yeah, you know, um, there was definitely a lot of people here and also some Dutch fans. And, um, you know, I got uh, got some good support. And also after winning the, the second moto here, uh, the Italian fans went crazy as well. So uh, this was a special feeling and, um, you know, it fe felt really good. And what about the track now, though? How is it different to uh, last year? Um, they only changed one part. It's on the wave section. And, um, yeah, there's just a 90 de degree corner. So uh, And then the waves are a little bit different. You can jump triple in and triple out. Or you have to do double, double, double. So, um, just looking at some of the footage actually from you last year in that battle with uh, Valentin Guillo. He lost the front here, didn't he? You took over the lead. Yeah. Uh, it was the next corner. I yeah, think next corner at the bottom yeah. of the hill, yeah. Yeah, he was pushing hard that moto, uh, especially in the beginning. And um, yeah, after uh, after I pass him again because uh, he passed me back, um, uh, was 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 good. And um, yeah, I just could keep uh, Herlings and Tonis in, in my visor, so um, you know I could hold the control. And uh, yeah, finally made a moto win again and uh, finish on the box. So that was good. You mentioned you know the tracks changed a little bit, but then you know it must still feel different for you doing it on a 450. I mean, uh, your first year in MXGP this year so how yeah. kind of difference is it riding on the bigger bike you know um we have a very very light bike the suzuki 450 is only three kilo more than the 250 but you know because of the power it still feels more heavy you know i uh, also had already a little crash this morning you know it surprised me a little bit and uh, yeah i went down so um no it's definitely uh, uh different and um yeah just getting used to it you know and, and also first practice well, was was good already so how about the rain? Because we had a lot of rain yesterday. Uh, we're supposed to have rain today. If it does rain, how will that affect the track after the practice session you've had today? Um, I, I think not, not at all. You know, uh, it, it was raining a lot the last few days, and uh, I thought it was going to be mud this morning already. But, um, yeah, track was actually really dry already. So um, uh, just the rain doesn't matter that much, I think. And on a track like this, what do you think about your prospects? I mean, I think it's, it's very tight. It's narrow in places. Is is a top five start essential if you want to kind of dream of a, a top five, top ten finish? Yeah, I think that's for sure. I was last year also, you know, uh, first moto I got a bad start last year and yeah, only finished in eight. So um, definitely need uh, need a good start here because of the tight corners and um, you know the speed is every everybody is really close to each other. So uh, for sure, it's important to get a good start. How are you finding MXGP in general? Um, I saw you at the Hawkstone International race earlier on in the season. You rode, you rode really well there, but then you picked up a small injury. So what did that do to your preparation coming into Qatar? And obviously, after Qatar, have you found it racing with the guys in, uh, in MXGP? Um, yeah, I got an injury after uh, oh, just one day before Valence International race, and uh, I broke both my tools. And um, yeah, that was affecting a lot. I thought uh, yeah, it should only take one week. And... Um, that definitely not happened. So um, I got, uh, I think for four weeks, didn't ride at all. And uh, yeah, I had to change my practicing. And uh, yeah, it was for sure not, not good for Qatar and Thailand. Uh, Qatar, I got uh, still a lot of pain. Uh, Thailand was a little bit better, but then I, I hit it in a qualifying race. And um, yeah, then I hit it again, so it was painful. But um, yeah. What, what about Argentina? How was the track? A lot of riders saying when they arrived at the track on Thursday or Friday, that the actual circuit, you know, a lot of them were fans of it straight away. What was it like to ride, though? Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, the speed was really high. It was a bit sandy on top, but uh, on the bottom, you know, it was still hard. 
But uh, I really enjoyed the track. Uh, it was also uh, a lot of possibilities to pass, and um, you know it's always nice to ride on uh, on high speed. So um, yeah, it was it was a great track. I mean, I've heard some people say moving from MX2 to MXGP, the difference is in MX2 gate, a lot of riders quite nervous, still trying to work out what to do with the race. You know, the preparation, you can see almost the inexperience, if you like. But when you get to MXGP, everybody around you is set. They've got their rhythm, their focus straight away. Even from like five minutes before the gate's going to drop, everybody's completely ready to go. So you've yeah. got to be switched on from the beginning. Is it like that? I mean, have you seen a, like a step up in terms of what you need to be and, and how you need to prepare? Um, I think just the difference between MX, MX2 and MXGP is, is just um, in the MX2 they are more wild, you know, they, they just go for it. You need you need a real fast bike and uh, yeah, I think for the MXGP uh, it's just the opposite. You need a bike that you can ride easily and uh, that you can handle good and also the riding is, is different, you know. Uh, how more experience you have in the MXGP class, uh, how, how easier it's going to be. Because um, yeah, I'm, I'm still learning a lot every every single weekend. So um, no, it's uh, it, it's definitely way different. So uh, yeah, it, it's important to make the whole season this year to get all the experience and uh, maybe to make next year so, so some good results. Well, we are almost out of time with you, Glenn. But um, obviously, you missed your home Grand Prix in Valkenswald last year. That is next week, one week's time. Um, with the clip we just saw from you there in Argentina, you started sixth in the second race, eventually dropped to eighth, but it was a top ten finish, the first of the season for you. Um, how excited, how much are you looking forward to going back racing at home next, year, uh, next weekend? Is it too soon in terms of where you're at with speed, fitness after the injury, or do you think actually because it's Falcon Swad, you're pretty much ready to go? No, I think uh, I just see it as a every normal GP, you know, same as here, and... Um I don't going to put pressure on myself. Uh, I think uh, I will be in places like uh, from 8 to 12th on the moment. And um, yeah, how long the year is going to be, um, I want to close in for sure to the to the top five. And um, but that's going to be difficult for sure because there are a lot of top guys. But um, you know, just just keep it. Uh, yeah, keep this line up because I improve uh, every single GP. So uh, just keep it like this, and yeah, we we'll see where. Uh, on the end of the season. Last Dutch rider on MSGP podium must be Mark de Riva. Maybe Probably. 2000 and 2011, somewhere around about that. Maybe. So it's been a good few years. Yeah. You're going to have to do it this year, Glenn. <laughs> Especially yeah, if Herlings good. moves up next year, then it's got to it's be you this year. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no <laughs> pressure. <laughs> but we are out of time with Glenn, uh, unfortunately. But uh, Glenn Koldenhoff, Rockstar Energy Suzuki Europe, thanks for joining us here. All the best this weekend, of course, next week as well at your home race in Falcons World. Thank right, you. before we ma meet our next guest, let's see what happened in uh, Argentina three weeks ago. Here's some highlights from uh, the MX2 first race. It was exciting as well. And Dylan Ferrandis was on fire. In the MX2 qualifying race, Jeffrey Hurlings raced to his third pole position of the season ahead of his young teammate Paul Jonas, but it wasn't such a good outing for Tim Geiser on the Honda Gary Body Machine coming home in 15th. The riders lined up to take their places on the start line. Jeffrey Hurlings up the inside, gate number one, but he didn't make the best of starts. A little bit of wheel spin as he came out of the gate. Put him on the back foot immediately. Julian Lieber got squeezed and so too did the two Red Bull KTMs by Dylan Ferrandis. But it was Jeremy Siwa who raced to the foxhole shot. But coming into turn four, Jeffrey Hurlings got nudged by his teammate, crashed out spectacularly. Picked himself up, but his bike was too damaged to rejoin the race. So that meant then we would see a new race winner here in race one in Patagonia. Dylan Ferrandis led briefly, but then he was overtaken by number 41 of Jonas, and they battled for the lead. Just behind them, Julian Lieber on the 33 Yamaha and Max Anstey on the 99 Kawasaki battled over third. Anstey eventually found his way through by lap three and stayed there for the majority of the race. Meanwhile, Ferrandis was all over the back of Jonas, and the two were side by side, bar to bar. And on lap five, Dylan Ferrandis eventually found a way through and was back into the lead. Jeffrey Hurlings, meanwhile, was receiving treatment in pit lane for an injured ankle sustained in the crash. Jeremy Siwa was lucky to escape the crash as he raced around on his Rockstar Energy Suzuki in fifth position, which is where he would stay when the chequered flag fell, but not so lucky for Jens Getterman. 
the JTAC Honda rider took a spill and did not finish race one. Thomas Covington and the 92 of Valentin Guio, they had their own little battle going on, four, six, and seventh. Eventually, it would go the way of Valentin Guio. The American Covington would finish in seventh, but Dylan Ferrandis was masterful at the head of the field and would eventually go on to take victory in race one. Jonas was second, Anstey was third, Lieber and Siwa rounded out the top five. But Dylan Ferrandis it is who was victorious this weekend in Argentina. What will they do in Italy next time out? Right, we're back here now with our next guest, Alexander Tonkov, Wilvo, uh, Wilvo Nastan, Husqvarna Factory Racing, bit of a mouthful. Um, I will get it right, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, Alex, welcome back. We've had three weeks off since Argentina. What have you been doing? Oh, I've been like resting, I think, for one and a half week because I had a small problem with my shoulder after the crash in Argentina, so I was not allowed to train. So I have some rest time. I was here in Italy on the lake, you know, a little bit chilling. But yeah, since like I think last one and a half week, we are back, you know, testing with the new bikes. And so it was pretty busy weeks, you know. How's the shoulder? And uh, you just mentioned a uh, shoulder injury there. Um, I'm going to take you back briefly to... Uh the GP of uh, Mexico in Leon last year, that crash between uh, you and, and uh, Jordi Tixier, that second moto. Um, I know we've got that clip coming up, but uh, how's the shoulder injury now that you just had, but more importantly, from this crash here, we're gonna watch it now. What was going through your mind at that moment? <laughs> <laughs> for sure, I don't expect it's going to be end up like it's ended, you know. But in the end, when I see now the video, I realize I'm even lucky, you know, it can be much worse. So, one side I'm lucky, from other side, you know, I will never think it can happen something like that, you know. Mm. A lot so. of people gave you stick, didn't they? Because they said it was a deliberate thing. But uh, Jordi admitted afterwards he made a mistake on the approach. Yeah, I mean, Jordi, he don't even understand on the beginning what happened, you know, because he, after, he, you know, the race, he tell me, why you grab my wheel, why you try to stop me? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> man, what are you talking about? And he don't believe me what my hand went in his wheel, you know? Yeah. He was like looking at me, man, he thinks I tried to help Jeffrey or something, you know? I'm like, man, what are you talking about? I almost lost my hand now for that. <laughs> you can see that GoPro image. Yeah. You've been dragged like 10 meters there. It's, yeah, it must so. have been And there were burns as well. Yeah. <laughs> it was a horrible, horrible injury. Yeah, I'm still now. I mean, it's pretty bad. You can see, like, here, you know, I still have a small piece here and really big piece there. Mm. It's slowly getting better, but, you know, to be perfect, I think it's never going to come back. That's what makes your performance, sorry, Paul, um, you know, was it a week later, two weeks later, Motocross of Nations? Yeah, we're going to talk about leading. that. that was, uh, later, yeah. yeah, I think for me, it was, like, the biggest question was so, two weeks if I'm going to ride or not, you know, because I was not training, doing anything because I was like stuck, you know, mm. in my bed. I cannot move because it started getting dry, you know, all like skins broken all the time. So I was like, man, can I ride or not, you yeah. know? So I just came with a new bike. I never ride 350 and I did like two three laps and I put the fastest lap down. I was like, man, what's that? You know, <laughs> I never put the fastest lap down in MX2 for all season when I was healthy. <laughs> and here I was like, man. Well, talking about MX2, you are currently fourth in the standings. Every race has been inside the top 10, and that's including a couple of 10th place finishes. How are you feeling uh, with the bike? We'll talk about the 2015 bike so far, because that's where we're yeah. at at the moment. So, like, Qatar was pretty good, you know, we start good, and I have a crash, and my shoulder came out in the first moto, so, and since that, I live struggle with the shoulder, and the yeah, second moto is good, I finished third, and Thailand, it's like always, you know, nothing changed for me, <laughs> hit, <laughs> get me faster than I expect, like always, but... You know, then we came to Argentina, again, struggled the first motor, the stone went in the brake, so I have no brakes all first motor, so I was again like 10, and second motor was good, was riding in the top 5, and then, yeah, I make that mistake and crash. I mean, so far it's going good, just have to be a little bit more consistent, I think, and yeah, get a better start, you know, like, finally in Argentina I get a good start, like I want it, so, and it was much <laughs> more easy, you know, I get the rhythm straight, and... This wasn't a good start? <laughs> <laughs> Second race. I was five, I think. No, yeah, third. You finished in third in this race. Yeah. So that was your first podium of the year in, in terms of the race finish. Top three. For the last two years, three, yeah. I think I finished first time in the top three. Eh? Last yeah. time was, I think, Lockett, yeah. 2013. Let's face it, though, Alex. When I mean, you're, you're still when I was young, you know. And <laughs> you're long overdue a podium, aren't you? I mean, you must be one of the unluckiest riders in MX2 currently. I have some troubles for sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, and, but, you know, I'm going to go through, I know, and... Pff, we're going to be stronger, you know. Yeah, but then now Husqvarna give you a new bike. So That helps, you know. That's going to help to go through that, you know. So How is the new bike? 
because you wrote, you've obviously tested it coming into here uh, and you're racing it. Yeah. There's going to be an official presentation tonight, meet and yeah. greet, and we'll get to see it as journalists. But how is it? I didn't spend so much time on the bike, you know, but I did around maybe 10 hours on the bike, you know, because the, we was res racing the Argentina, we fly and there and here, then I have an injury. So I was not so much time on the bike, but I mean, so far I feel comfortable, you know, that's important and I like. So it's not something like, you know, I was thinking to race that or not, you know. I make decisions straight, I will race the bike, you know, because, you know, I feel comfortable, why not, you know. It's, I always like to bring something new, you know. It's not always came good on from like I don't know like luck. No, like last year I came with the air shock here and I have some you know some problems and but like this year I'm pretty sure you know what I'm doing and like today on the warm up I feel pretty good you know so we see how it's going now with the bum, more bumps and when the track's gonna be more difficult more technical but so far I feel good. It's your second year as a factory rider. Are you completely used to that now? You know like having to try new stuff and you know carry kind of almost a team by yourself. Yeah, kind of. I'm not really a guy who likes so much testing, you know, but when I have to do, I do, you know, like I spend a lot of time with the new bike, you know, I didn't ride so many days, but I've been like full days testing, so get used or not, I'm still like many times complaining, you know, like on myself, you know, yeah. like, is it better or not, like, you know, so I'm always like, you know, don't even trust myself, you know, <laughs> what I'm feeling, <laughs> but it's getting better, you know. Start feeling more. Um, before we let you go, uh, Adam just mentioned it just briefly, Motocross the Nations last year, and this is obviously leading into uh, possibly next year riding in MXGP. Um, the Motocross the Nations did take everybody by surprise. Um, what was that like for you in the races? Because you just said about the qual qualifying, the time training, and how you were fastest, but you had some impressive performances in the races as well, didn't you? Yeah, I mean... Unfortunately, my fitness was not great there, you know, because I was on the painkillers and everything because my hand was terrible, you know. So, but the bike was so good. I mean, the stars, I was pulling the whole shot. So I was feeling like, you know, I have a hundred horsepower more than everybody, you know, <laughs> on the beginning. Did anybody protest? That you uh, had 100 horsepower more. I don't know, actually. They can. I have 100 less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <In the end. laughs> but, I mean, the bike was amazing, you know. I, n I never ride at 350 factory, but the bike was like, you know, like I want it, you know. Mm. When I start, I always get an arm pump all season long on the warm-ups or something, you know. And then I didn't ride two weeks on the bike and I went for the fast lap. No arm pumps, nothing. Just feel cold. I enter in the, in the pit lane and I say, man, I make a mistake. I want to go for another lap, you know. And everybody looks, man. Come on. <laughs> How was it for support as well? I'm guessing there were a few Russian supporters there. Oh, there was a lot, man. It was like, I was feeling like in Russia, you know, there was some huge Russian flag and you can see him every lap and the Russians was, it was many. And it's, I always loved the race. One of the reasons why so many Russian people there and my family comes to support me and like many, many guys and all the Estimo motorsport crew is there always. And so it's, it's really nice to be there. I really love all the nation's races, you know, it's always a good time there, you know, after the race, it's a party always. And, you know, it's like I always go there without the pressure, without anything. It's just, it's not about points and money, you know, really. It's just about having fun, you know, and mm. to race for your country and with your buddies, you know, with who I raced when I was a kid in Russia. So that's pretty cool. How many uh, seasons have you got left in MX2? Is it two now? You're this one and one more. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you, you want to see it out until you reach 23 or are you thinking about MXGP already? It's all about you know what you get <laughs> <laughs> and so also maybe see how the rest of the season goes as well i'm not really like the guy who's gonna say no man i'm gonna ride till 23 and mix two you know so if you can get a good this like good opportunity to go in the mix one you know why not you know mm. so i like the bike and i know i can ride 450 or 350 you know so what's strange maybe when you look me on 250 you'll say fuck that guy gonna be dangerous on the big bike you know and then not it goes all the way around on the big bike are going like much more safety than on the small bike so it's like really strange so the russian you know the russians are not really same as alex it's been three years since we had a grand prix in russia and i remember that race and there was just so many people it was crazy how many people were, were turning up to that kind of that new track we had at semi gorge is mm. what you say? Semi -gorge. yeah yeah so what you know from stuff you hear back home what are the chances of going back to russia again maybe next year but honestly i was also really surprised how many people it was because the place was in the middle of nowhere honestly and i was like really surprised when i see all the crew coming like the traffic you know the people and like the people are so positive everybody you know and track was also nice you know track was not bad and yeah we have even rain on saturday but sunday track was fine and for sure 
I'm missing these days for sure because you know it's always good opportunity to go once in Russia because normally I go like month or a year you know so and I'm always missing my country and I'm like probably many people know I really like Russian you know I'm really patriotic and I really like that stuff so I really always enjoy to go there and see my friends my family and I would like to go there again for sure all right well look uh, we're out of time now with Alexander Tonkov but um of course, again, we wish him all the best this weekend and uh, hopefully that new 2016 Husqvarna 250 yeah, uh, get, gets the results <laughs> for him that he wants this weekend. Maybe yeah. see him on the podium for the first time. That'll be interesting yeah. if it does. Right, so uh, thank you, Alex, thank and you uh, all the rest. Right, coming up is uh, another chance to win here on MXGP. It's competition time. So, the first three rounds, we've been running our Get Athena photograph competition, where you have the chance to win with OGO. This competition will run <coughs> all season long. But this week's competition is a new one, and it gives you the chance to win with Epon. All you have to do is answer the following question, and you have to answer it correctly. Epon Lubricants are the proud sponsors of the 2014 FIM MX2 World Champion. But who was the 2014 FIM MX2 world champion. Was it Benoit Pacherel, Geordie Tixier, or Jeffrey Hurlings? Submit your answer on our MXGP Facebook page, or for more information, go to our website, mxgp.com. Remember, you have to be in it to win it, so good luck with that. Ipon Goodies could be making their way to you if you guess correctly. Also, it's worth mentioning now that MXGP TV is offering a 20% discount on our season pass, which also includes the FIM Monster Energy Motocross of Nations. So don't miss out on that. Right, our final guest is in place, Davey Coombs from RacerX, all the way from the USA as well, I hasten to add. Uh, good to see <laughs> you here, Davey. It's good um, to be here. It's, it's almost like a Motocross of Nations for you, isn't it? Fly in, fly out. You're just here for a few days. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I try to get over to as many races as I can. And Usually it is the destinations, and last year I couldn't make it to Latvia. And uh, with Ryan being over here and uh, the folks at Alpen Stars invited us to come visit, I was like, um, sure. And uh, my mom came. So we're having a ball. We went to Venice. We've gone to all the World War One cemeteries and churches, and you know, I'm just full tourist mode. Good lad. And um, obviously, talking about the MXGP season 2015, first three rounds, what have you made of it so far? Uh, you know, from all aspects. Um, I'm. Very surprised about two things. One, that, that Tony hasn't won a race yet. Two, that Max Snoggle has won two races. Uh, but I think everyone's kind of right where I thought they would be. I, I, I think uh, you and I were bench racing before the year, and I said, you know, there's going to be so much pressure on Tony and Ryan that guys like Gautier and Clement Dassault and, and, and even Max Snoggle are going to be able to sneak in there. And I, I, I think we're seeing that, although I think they're going to get down to business now that we're on the continent. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in Ryan Villapoto. Opinions are divided both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, what have you made of his performances so far, starting in Qatar, which was a pretty rough start for him, wasn't it? That yeah, first race, yeah. that first gate drop of the yeah, season. And, you know, not to make excuses, and, and no one needs to make an excuse for Ryan Villapoto, but uh, he hadn't raced in you know, a long time. So uh, an outdoor national, uh, I don't think we saw him in, since August of 2013, and he stalls off the start, so right there it shows how sort of ring rusty he was. But and, we were talking about that this morning. You said maybe electronics had something to do with that. I understand that the, the parts that he had on the bike were not necessarily the parts that he's used to, and I think that he hit the rev limiter. And that obviously got Clint uh, clipped there by Poutron yeah. as it was coming back through the second lap, so well, not the best start. That was no. a Grand Prix baptism, wasn't it? You know, yeah. being clipped by Jose Poutron in a Grand Prix. There you go. You're official Grand Prix rider now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he has, obviously, we know he can win races. Um, mm. He's a hard charger, and he came through as best he could. Second one, it was, um, I think, a rear brake problem, so it kept him just inside the top ten. Not, ex not exactly where we expected him to see, but he changed all that, didn't he, uh, both of you, in uh, Thailand a week later yeah, with a race win and the overall. Yeah, I, I, th I think he flew back to Germany and Belgium and, and mm. immediately went to work. And I think that with him it was a little difficult because he had not raced in so long. He maybe should have done some of those preseason races. I, I personally would love to have seen him in Anaheim, but mm. those are such different animals that uh, he needed to do some motocross racing. And I think that he really wanted to prove something as soon as he got to Thailand. And I was watching with uh, Jeff Emig at Daytona whenever they had the qualifying race, and he went down through those whoops so mm. fast on Saturday. I was like, that's the Ryan Villapoto we sent over. Yeah. It, was, it was a sight to behold. I think it's uh, the message coming out of the Villapoto camp for the first few motos of the year was very much like they were completely off with their suspension. You know, they, they envisaged 
you know, running kind of a US kind of style setup. And, you know, somebody else, I think it might even be Casey Stoner pointed out to me that, you know, the Europeans just ride tracks differently to the US riders. Yeah. We get like a one sided view pool because we're seeing Grand Prix all the time. But, you know, it's, uh, I think Ryan really, he talks about adjustment. I think people see him as some kind of superhero, some sort of super rider that could, you know, just churn off victories and, and, and hit corners faster than anybody else. But the truth was, he did have to get used to it. Yeah. He's, he's not perfect 100 you know, he needs to adjust to a new playing field but as davy said you know he was ring rusty hadn't raced in how long months uh, and then obviously coming into a, a whole new area one that he doesn't know what was interesting about this race was though and i'd sort of said this all along to you to anybody else who would listen was qatar would be the round that he wouldn't necessarily struggle with it's not a difficult circuit to learn mm. but the other guys had been there here and also in argentina where we have a clip in a minute um a level playing field for everybody and as soon as people saw the track in Thailand they were like yep yeah, RB's name all over it the heat the humidity that kind of thing of course he destroyed everybody in the qualifying race mm. but then we see that he was all out in the qualifying race and everybody yeah. else they He's knew off. what was to yeah. come yeah. for yeah. the next day and that kind of proved maybe a little bit you know to be the case in the second race when he wasn't able to go with uh, DeSalle and with Kai Rowley. Yeah, it's a big ocean that separates Grand Prix motocross from what we do in America. And, you know, there's so much less time on the tracks. Ryan's a fast learner, but I think that he needs to take his time. Okay. And I think you're going to start seeing that. The, the races and the qualifying on Saturday, it's great for him that he gets to learn the tracks, but, you know, they don't give any points. You know, a second or third place starting pick, I think, is, uh, is, is, is better and getting your bike exactly where it needs to be on Sunday, I also think that because of the amount of traffic and the way we do our tracks and the way the tracks are done over here, that's also going to be an acquired taste for him. But hey, he, you know, he, he, he learned Supercross, he learned how to ride in the sand, now he's got to learn how to ride in Europe. But can he afford to take his time, Davey? It's a one shot deal, one year deal, you know? I mean, he, he can't lose 50, 60 points. It's only Cairo Lee. Well, there. that's just it. He hasn't lost so many points yet. And that's why, you know, I think that it's fantastic that Clement's winning and, and Max is doing so well. And I, I don't think we've seen the best of Gautier mm. yet. But he's still fairly close with Caroli, and that's the real challenge. Oh. And if those guys focus on each other too much, I would be pretty happy to be the rock star Suzuki guy. <laughs> but, here, but this is the thing, you know, I don't think either of those are going to be too hellbent on worrying about each other. They also know that Paul Ann is underperforming at the moment. They also know that yeah. Nagel's won two out of the three Grand Prix. DeSalle has the championship lead. You know, they both have a, a situation to deal with here. What did you make of Argentina, though? Um, that, that, was, that was actually more surprising to me than, than Thailand. I knew that, or not Thailand, I should say, Qatar. Yeah. I knew that he was going to be rusty. And I, you know, watching the times on the, 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 the day before and whatnot. But when he got to Argentina, it seemed like that was going to be his track. And it seemed like he just didn't pull the trigger right when he needed to. And I, I, I think that, again, that kind of comes with learning the system and knowing when to attack and how to attack. And that starts with qualifying on Saturday because the, I don't know if you saw the qualifying race, but again, he didn't give himself the best opportunity, did he? 10th through 11th, 12th, first corner, but was again in a, on a mission to go mm -hmm. chase down Tony and DeSalle and Max, you know, because he wanted to win that qualifying race, which there's nothing wrong with wanting to win races. You just now over here, he has to pick the ones that yeah. offer the points. Exactly. And, 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 you know, I like to think about the last run of his Supercross career. He led the last 80 laps in 2014. He mm. won the last four main events. He clinched the title well ahead of time. But he's just so fierce of a competitor. And in, in a long haul like you have here, he's got to keep going through September. Even though we have more races in America, I think that the, the, the travel and the length of the weekends in Europe and on the GP circuit is something that he's going to have to learn. And I, I, I have faith in him. I think it's going to be a, a, a pretty... Uh, interesting summer to come and i think it starts right here but also i think while we have such fantastic parity in mxgp and there are different riders winning races i mean clement de salle got to paul and max nagel their problem is not winning races it's being at races yes especially in the the, the last final third of the season so uh, you know that's somewhere where tony Cairoli's, you know specialized and ryan Villapod also you don't have to tell me that i think paul could go qualify for the supercross <laughs> in california this weekend <laughs> we have so many injured guys on our circuit it's, it's the same thing it's a uh, it's, it's gotten so competitive and so cutthroat, no matter what kind of motocross we're doing. Uh, staying healthy is the actual, probably, number one goal for all these guys. Well, 38 points separate the top six riders. Um, coming over from the U.S., what are you expecting to see this weekend? We are almost out of time, by the way. Yeah, I didn't get to walk the track yet and check it out. Uh, I would not be surprised if neither Tony or Ryan won this race. But I do think their wins are coming.
but about you? your tip for this race. <laughs> Come on, I'm going to put you on the spot. Davey uh, just has a new career in I, politics. I, I know who he wants, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. I want him to say on air, because then I'll uh, say on air. I, well. I, I, I will always root for the AMA champion <laughs> when, the, when it comes down to it, but uh, I would like to see a good race. And, uh, you know, all five of the top five guys right now, as well as Van Horbeek, all good guys. I think you guys are really lucky to have everyone healthy and competing right now. All right, Davey, uh, thanks for joining us. Of course, Adam as well. And uh, thanks to uh, Glenn Koldenoff, Alex Tonkop as well. We are out of time here at Pietra Murata, but round four is just around the corner. We hope you can join us. Commander Sal was the winner in MXGP here last year. Will he do it again as a championship leader in 2015? We hope you can join us for the races live on Sunday. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.